can see that right now, you see in the red circle um, there on the right hand side, uh, some of the references in the Synoptic Gospels as well as in the Epistles that um, call attention back to Psalm 22. So we're going to be we're working through these passages that you see on the left hand side um, over the next um, again, three or four weeks. Um, so I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles now if you would with, to, with me to Psalm 22. I'm going to read out loud as you follow along. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, Psalm 22. We're going to now, last week we read the first half of the psalm, and now we're going to read the second half. Psalm 22, follow along as I read verse 16 and following. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I, count, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion, and from the rescue me from the hand of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him, and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For kingships belong to the Lord, and the rulers of the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall that worship before him shall bow all who look down to the dust. Even the ones who come uh, could not keep themselves alive. Hostile them, it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done. Now, as we think of our Thanksgiving week, I wanted, we are in the middle of reading through uh, different books uh, in the New Testament. We actually came to a conclusion in 2 Timothy last week. So, uh, deviating a little bit for our second reading, I want to call our attention to Psalm 136. Now, we're going to do something a little bit different here, and that is, if, uh, if you've read Psalm 136 before, you notice that there is basically a descant at the end of the verse. Um, so there's a statement, and then you can imagine being there when the, uh, the worship leader, the king, um, uh, would stand in the midst of the congregation and proclaim something, and the congregation would respond. And so that's what we're going to do um, today. Um, we are going to have me read the beginning of each of these verses, and I would like you to respond, for his steadfast love endures forever. So we're going to read the entirety of one Psalm 136, and, and if you could um, repeat with me at the end of each verse, or say with me, for his steadfast love endures forever, and we will end in verse 26 um, together. Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone has great wonders. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights. For his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day. For his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night. For his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them for his, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
the strong and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea in two. And made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. And killed mighty kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites. And Og, king of Bashan. And gave their land as a heritage. A heritage to Israel, his servant. It is he who remembered us in our real estate. And rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh. Give thanks to the God of heaven. We're going to pray and we're going to sing some songs. We're going to open the scriptures here in a moment, in a few moments. But as we do so, this week we need to call to remembrance, as we should every week, but this week particularly as we're, we're called as a society to give thanks. To give thanks to the mighty deeds that God has done as the psalmist uh, would have written this and penned it and repeated it in the congregation. Oh, constant reminder to ourselves of the good deeds from God. His steadfast love has endured forever and it endures in all of our situations. All right, so let's give thanks. Give thanks to the God of heaven. We're going to sing these songs in thankfulness to the God of heaven. Stand with me. I'm going to pray. The musician will come up, and then we will continue in service. Father, we recognize the goodness of God, and we recognize the goodness of God regardless of the situation, uh, whether it is a Red Sea event or the onslaught of a king of Bashan or whether it on some situation that we might have personal, whatever it is throughout all of history, your steadfast love has never ceased. Uh, your covenant love uh, has, has, has never gone away. It has always been there. Uh, for you are faithful. And as we give thanks to you today, as we give thanks to you this week, in a, in a special way, we call to remember our remembrance in our own minds how God's steadfast love has been delivered in Christ.
weeks about, well, for years we've been talking about uh, church planting as we ourselves are a church plant, but also the desire to reproduce ourselves. And um, you know, a few months ago, I had an opportunity to be honored to have breakfast with Cross Point, you might remember, uh, he and Tara came and ministered to us in music. Uh, but Chris uh, is a pastor at Grace Church. I've had the opportunity and privilege of preaching there. They love Christ, love the Word. Uh, very similar uh, congregation that uh, cherishes his, his values, the same things. And we've been, he's been burdened uh, with a number of other pastors about church planting in Arizona. And God has put a number of things uh, in his, both his mind and experience, as well as uh, going along with others. And so we wanted him to come tonight, first to preach uh, the word of God to us, and then secondly to talk to us about the growth, which is a, a proposed church planting, call a network, but a fellowship of uh, like-minded churches that, are, that, that love the gospel, love uh, God's word and God's people, and are talking working together, which is exciting. So I'm going to have Chris to come and preach to us and share the Word of God. For those who are want to go to Children's Church, you can go to the back at this time, and there'll be a time of scripture memory and, and fellowship back there, and you can invite your friends, Chris. Real quick, that was, that was a very serious introduction. When I first met Chris, we went out to dinner together, and, and you invited us and we ate a, I don't know how we got there, we ate a Buffalo Wild Wings, and the Patriots and the Colts were playing. Yes. And Beth, the whole meal, was aghast, I think. She wasn't aghast, her eyes were glued to the TV. So she, like, ignored you guys. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a fun, so, I'm a Bears fan, and they're he's a Packers fan, so only by the grace of the gospel could we actually be friends. I'm moving this up a bit, and I don't know, I'm going to mess with this a little bit, is that okay? Yeah. We good? All right. Well, I'm going to just read readings from Grace Church right down the street, uh, as well as ask a question, what is the issue with the middle section here? <laughs> because it seems like, maybe, this could be, um, that's a little awkward, you know? Like, you look, I thought you were trying to make it easier on me by everybody sitting in the middle, but now I have to look to the left, and I have to look to the right, it's okay. We're going to make our way through it. I bring greetings from Grace Church. Uh, like, like Tim said, we're a congregation a lot like yours. We love the gospel. We love Jesus. We want to see his name treasured among not just our churches, but among the entire city of Phoenix and the state of Arizona. And uh, I'll share a bit more on the back end of the message about this idea that's starting to form up um, that I've shared with Robbie and with, with Tim. But before we do that, I want to get to to God's word, and I think really when we when we see what God's word says, it will actually drive us into the need for churches and why we need healthy churches spread across the state. So, if you could open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter four, we're going to be in verses one through thirteen, and I am going to attempt for the first time ever to use one of these clicker things to run the slides during the sermon. This is a big day for me, so. Uh, hopefully it goes okay. Uh, I also just wanted to issue congratulations to you. You made it through 2020, which was a big deal, and now you're almost through 2021, which is another big deal. So when you get to your Thanksgiving dinner, don't overlook just the, the mere fact that you survived 2020 and 2021 uh, is a big deal and worthy of praise, and yet it's left us all pretty much exhausted. If you're like me, if I'm just being honest with you, Really tired. Has anybody else exhausted here in this room? And I see a hand. Can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah from the choir or whatever? But we're tired people um, because of life and just the you know just the circumstances that we have found ourselves in and the busyness of our lives. We're tired people. We all need rest. Now we don't want to admit that we need rest. No, we don't want to do that. Um, when I was in college, I pretty much just sort of like, I would spend, I would stay up all night just to stay up all night. I would push all my assignments to the end of, uh, to the 11th, all-nighters to get projects done. I'd be up to one or two, 
those things. I kind of adopted a mentality that was like rest is for the weak and sort of I'll, I'll rest when I die kind of mentality um, and just not really wanting the days to end. But now that I've entered into my 40s, like I know there are people here who are older than me, but I think the cutoff line is like 40 and then everyone above it is just old and just tired. <laughs> because now that I'm in my 40s, it's not at all the same. About two Sundays ago, all Halloween weekend, I finished my sermon at 1.30 a.m., which was a normal Saturday night, Sunday morning, which was a normal time for me to end in the beginning of church planting. And so I went to bed. I didn't sleep well. I got up. I preached. I went home. I took a nap. And I was like a zombie all the rest of the day, which was fine because it was Halloween. And so, uh, but then I woke up on Monday, and on Monday, my body was still yelling at me. It was still angry. Why did you do this to me? And it was a sobering reminder that I needed rest. And we all need rest. We are not the creator. We are the creators. There's only one who neither slumbers nor sleeps, and that is God. And I say all of that to you as we begin Hebrews chapter 4, because I don't want you confused as we come to this text, when you read the word rest, that you would think it's talking about an afternoon nap. It's not talking about an afternoon nap. It's not directing us to you know, a sleep number bed with your perfect sleep number or an ergonomic pillow that keeps your spine straight or anything like that at all. All those might be really great things. Um, but the kind of rest that we hear and see in Hebrews chapter 4 has really nothing to do with sleep other than what sleep is meant to point us towards. Rest is a deeply biblical concept we find throughout the entirety of the Bible. In fact, as we read in chapter 4, the passage we're going to read, we're going to find the theme of rest beginning with God and with creation itself. It's going to say six days he created, and on the seventh day he rested. And then if you know the Old Testament, you know it was a practice that was mirrored by Israel as they wandered the wilderness where they collected manna for six days, and then they rested from their work on their seventh day, just like God. So rest is held out as a promise to Israel. And then it's a promise that's held out for them as they take the promised land, or they're supposed to take the promised land. And then King David comes hundreds of years later after Moses and Joshua. He then, in Psalm 95, also speaks about God's rest. And then Hebrews picks up Psalm 95 and says, that rest is still available for you today. And finally, the experience of the fullness of rest is when we reach the new heavens and the new earth. So from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning of the Bible until the end, the theme is clear. We are made for rest. That's the theme that we're going to see here today. God's calling us to enter into a Sabbath rest, you and I, you and I. Let's read chapter 4, <coughs> verses 1 through 13. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the visions of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Would you pray with me? God, we've read your word, we've sung your word, we've heard your word. Lord, I pray 
pray you give us your spirit now to know your word, and to know you clearly. Lord, we, we believe, even as we read this, Lord, that we need rest. As Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And so, God, give us that rest tonight. Every person in the room, young or old, would find rest in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to try this and see how this works. So we're going to start with the role of faith in entering God's rest. We're really going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 for this, and really the whole sermon is, is verses 1 through 11. I just wanted to read some context. Our text begins with a hopeful and an alarming note. It says, it tells us from, from the very beginning, the promise of rest, whatever that means, it still exists. The promise of rest still stands, so it's hopeful. But it also has an alarming note as it begins, because it calls us to be afraid that we might not reach this rest. Look again with me in verse 1. It says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, lest let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The writer to the Hebrews is using this athletic metaphor to, to talk about finishing the race, reaching the end of the race. He's, he's writing this in the plural to the whole church, and he's telling the church, be alarmed at the prospect of not reaching this rest, of not entering into it. Back in chapter 3, there's, there's all of this wonderful exhortations to the church about how we're supposed to come alongside each other and we're to help each other by exhorting each other daily to see the grace of the gospel so that our hearts won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And, and he's saying here, you might fail to enter into it. That's why all of it was in chapter 3 matters. It's why you, you gather together Sunday by Sunday, even if you don't use the middle road. You, you gather together to encourage each other in the gospel so that your heart wouldn't be hardened, so that your, your sin wouldn't deceive you. And we see a problem here laid out in verse 2. It says, For good news came to us just as to them. I want to pause for a moment. It's not, the issue that he's about to lay out here is not that, you know, they got one set of information and then another group got another set of information. And so they're just lacking some knowledge. No, he's saying the same good news that comes to us as Christians, to the original uh, readers here and the church and that, that the writer's writing to, and even to us today. We get the same good news as the good news that was preached to, to them, which is talking to the Israelites, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So all of chapter 3 is setting up this picture of what Israel has failed to do and how it's failed to enter into the land, and, it's, and they've really failed to enter into God's rest. And he's trying to make this point, hearing the message is not enough. Hearing the message is not enough. It has to be accompanied by faith. So you can write the equation like this. Good news, we're going to do some math here, good news plus unbelief equals no rest. Good news plus unbelief equals no rest. In fact, several versions like the KJV and others translate this phrase that they, they didn't mix it with faith. So they were not united by faith, that's ESV, but in other translations, they didn't mix it with faith. So think about the way that paint is mixed, and two colors are mixed to make a third color, right? So if you've got blue and you've got red, and you mix it together, it, it turns into purple. It has to be mixed. And the whole point of the story of Israel, of them coming through the Exodus, of them wandering in the wilderness, the whole point of the story of Israel in chapter 3 that, that he writes about is to show that the people of God in the Old Covenant received the same promise, received the same good news, they received the promise of rest. Rest in the land. They get to the land. They're going to receive rest. It didn't benefit them because it didn't mix it with faith. However, since the promise of rest is still available, so while some don't get in, some do get in. While some don't receive the benefit of the promise, some do receive the benefit of the promise. And the difference between the two is faith. So good news plus faith equals the benefit of rest. Good news plus faith, not, not just intellect, not knowledge, but trust. Good news plus trust equals the benefit of rest. You know, faith is one of those things that's hard to define 
But we can say a few things about faith. Faith is, it's not less than having knowledge, but it's more than knowledge. It's actually banking on the knowledge that you have. It's trusting in the knowledge that you have. Faith shows itself as an act of your will based on the knowledge that you have. Faith is not just knowing that the brakes on your car are supposed to slow your car down if you were to depress the brake. Faith is not just knowing that. Faith is jamming your foot on the pedal when a bicyclist cuts out to the middle of the road. And you reflexively turn to your knowledge and you bank on it and you press your foot down. That's faith. Your faith is shown by your trust. And Hebrews is writing to say, we've all heard the same good news. And the difference between those who listen and benefit and those who don't is trust. It's trusting, banking, faith. Which group are you in this afternoon? Now, a question that arises here is, how can the author say that this is the same good news that was given to Israel? How is it that we can say, we've received the same good news as what Israel got, what Joshua got? What, what kind of rest did Joshua expect to find in the promised land? I found this quote that I think sets it up really well by William Lane. Let's see here, please. Here we go. The concept of rest in the context of the promise to the Exodus generation had the connotation of entrance into Canaan, the promised land, and this is the key point, where Israel would experience relief and turmoil and security from their enemies. Let's read that again. Experience relief from turmoil and security from their enemies. Doesn't that sound great? Wouldn't you love relief from turmoil and security from all of your enemies? Doesn't that sound great? Isn't that what we all really want? Relief, security, protection. The promise of the land was not just a place to call home. It was a promise of restoration. It was a place of rest like the Garden of Eden was supposed to be, where, where they did work, where they worked the land, but it was under the security and protection of God. It's a place that would have been peaceful and not chaotic. If 2020 and 2021 has pointed us to anything, it's that we need this kind of rest. We long for this kind of rest. Because the true rest that was promised to Joshua was only typified by the land. Do you see that? It was promised to him, but it was only typified by the land. That same promise is offered to the Hebrews and to us. The same standing offer is offered to us today because the offer to the Christian is not entrance into a physical land, but it's a state of being in God. It's not first found in a place, but found in a person. The kind of promise that we're offered today is, is, is a reality that's grounded in creation, it's accomplished through the cross of Christ, and is received by faith. Listen, Jesus truly gives rest for the soul. Jesus is the one you run into from all, as a refuge from all your anxieties and worries and insecurities of your life. Jesus is the one who promises that your enemies will never get the upper hand. His unbreakable. And the urgent point of this text is that each one of you must personally receive it and believe it and trust on it for it to have any benefit to you whatsoever. So I'm going to put it in somewhat negative terms for a moment. You can show up to church. You can even sit in the middle row. You can sing all the songs. You can go to all the groups. You can bring all the tithes and offerings. You can hear all the sermons. You can do all the fellowship lunches. If you don't mix any of those things with the knowledge, with the knowledge of the gospel, with a soft heart that trusts in God, you will not experience salvation, which is this rest. You will find your hearts still anxious. You will question God's motives or why he works the way that he works. I am sure that that has to be some of you in this room. In fact, I would say it's probably all of us in this room at some point or another. Young, old, newly married, young adults, teenagers, kids, it doesn't matter. All of us must personally receive this in order to benefit from it. Do you have a heart of faith that trusts in God for your life or not? Here's the awesome promise of this text. The promise of entering his rest still stands. You can get it on it today. The second thing we see is the nature of God's rest from verses 3 through 5. Now, this is where it gets a bit complicated, but also, I think, really interesting. Let me read it again. 
Verse 3, for we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, and it quotes here from Psalm 95, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rests. So Psalm 95 is quoted twice here. It's quoted once in, in chapter 3. And the psalm, if you go back and read Psalm 95, the psalm ends with these staggering words. The psalm ends with this, they shall not enter my rest. That is a terrifying way to end the psalm. But the structure of the psalm is built to emphasize the warning. There are some who will not enter. But Hebrews emphasizes the reality that while some may fail to enter, the promise is actually still available for us today. It's, in fact, it says, if you have believed, verse 3, you have already entered into that rest that is promised. What we're going to find is that this rest is, is, is multifaceted. It's got a past tense element. It's got a present tense element. It's got a future tense element. If you believe, you've already entered into that rest that you must still strive to enter into now so that you'll experience it in the future. And now we're starting to see a bit about what this rest is like, this rest that was offered to Israel, but not tied to the land because it's still being offered to us. And we see it in a clue that's given in the very creation account back in Genesis 1. You see that it's quoting this, this creation account when, when God formed the world and then filled the world and each day, formed the earth, the seas, and the sky, and then he fills it with creatures, and then on the seventh day it says that God rested from his works. Now, if you're like me, you start to you know, read your Bible, and you know, January 1 is coming, and you're going to read your Bible, and you're going to start with Genesis, and you're going to read this account again, you're probably going to be just right past that, because you're already coming up with this. You've read it before. But I want you to think about this for a moment. We all need rest because we get tired. We get sleepy. Our cells need to repair. Think about this. God doesn't need any rest. God doesn't need to rest. Psalm 121, as we earlier, said earlier, he neither slumbers nor sleeps. You have a cycle of sleep. God never goes to sleep. He's never slumbering. He doesn't get sleepy. He doesn't yawn during your prayers. Like, come on, pick up the pace. He doesn't grow tired or fatigued or weary. He never lacks the energy. So why does he rest? Think about it. Why does he rest? He doesn't need to rest. What is the significance? And then when you think about that question, then you remember that in the life of Israel, this was a massively important, deeply theological reality. It set the whole pattern for how Israel's Sabbath keeping worked in the Old Covenant. Remember in the fourth commandment, it says this, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, for your, or your livestock or the sojourn who is within your gates. For in six days, so this is the reason why, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God didn't need to rest, but he rested. And so for thousands of years, this weekly pattern was established, right? This weekly pattern from generation to generation to generation that was established and rehearsed and repeated and interwoven in their lives, in the, in the, in the, in the weekly lives of these, of these Jewish people, rooted in the seventh day of creation. Mom, Dad, why are we not, why are we, why are we not gathering manna again? This is the day that we rest. Six days we work, and on the seventh day we rest. That's the pattern, right? Work, work, work. Work, 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 and rest. Work, 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 and rest. All of this is reflecting the pattern of God. So we see, as we kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together, that the promise of rest that is still offered to us is somehow connected to the rest that God himself took after all of his cosmic creation was completed. That, that rest is what's being offered to us. That's why he calls it my rest. It's rooted in him. It's connected to him. It's, it's experienced by him. And cosmically speaking, God's rest that's been happening since the beginning of creation has never stopped. He never restarted a different pattern. 
He works and then he rests, and that rest goes on forever. It's an abiding rest. It's a continuous rest. It's a complete, sovereign rest. He has done all of the work to set up creation, and then he rested in himself. I found this quote from Richard Phillips, which I think highlights the sovereign nature of God's rest. He writes, we do not mean that he went on vacation or removed his care from our worlds. So this is not the kind of rest that you plan since July in Arizona summer, and you make your way to the beach, and you just, all I want to do is rest and just sit in the chair and do nothing. That's not exactly what this is. The picture is rather that after having made an order to subdue the creation according to his desired plan, his control was so absolute, his sovereignty so unquestioned, that God enthroned himself without effective opposition. His reign is one of rest, that is absolute supremacy and unassailable sovereignty, so much so that he exercises all his rule from the position of rest. It is the kind of rest possible to a God who could say, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. So when we think of that Sabbath rest, we should immediately think of his utter, uncontested, sovereign rule. That is the nature of the rest we are invited into. Think about this. Not even Satan and sin and death has, can break that sovereign rest. God's sovereign over it all. And so there is an urgency to entering into this rest. Verses 6 through 11. I need to work on that. There's an urgency of entering God's rest. Read again now with me in verse 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So he's saying here that the same rest, it's the same rest that David was writing about in Psalm 95 when David wrote the words in Psalm 95. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, present tense, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. What he's saying is that the invitation to enter into that rest from Joshua was still available to David and was still available to the Church of Hebrews and is still available to us today because it is still today. What day is it? To, it's today. What day will it be Monday when we get there? It'll be today, right? We're never not in today. And today is the only day you have guaranteed to be on this earth. We know people that woke up on a day, and then didn't wake up again on the next day. That day was their last day on earth. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. But as long as it's called today, God invites you to believe in him, to put your trust in him, to bank on him. That's the whole point that he's trying to make here by highlighting David in Psalm 95, saying, all those years later, he wrote about this. The principle is that God still speaks to us in his word, even today. Even from those old writings, they're still speaking to a new generation today. Just as it was true for David, today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. Open your heart wide to God. Turn to him in faith. The promise of rest is still extended to you. In fact, it wasn't fully realized by Joshua and it's not closed off for us now. Verse 8, if Joshua, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. He's, he's saying that though Joshua did ultimately take the promised land, eventually, his leadership didn't secure the rest that God had promised, even in the promised land, where there was supposed to be this, right, this, this security and freedom from, from turmoil, even in the promised land, the people of Israel continued to rebel and didn't grab a hold of this rest. So then, verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Now we start to get to how this impacts us. How do we get this rest? 
We don't have to fly over to Israel. We don't have to take a land. We enter into this rest when we trust in Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, you enter into what is ultimately the true Sabbath rest, the true rest that the Lamb was pointing towards the whole time. That's why Jesus says in Matthew that Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. He is the true Sabbath rest for us. And listen, the Sabbath served creational goals in that it caused God's people to depend on him weekly. It caused his people to, to see to it that their self-sufficiency was checked and that they were, they were able to, to rest themselves from work and manufacture, and those things sort of was a, a check and balance on their own self-sufficiency, but it also served a gospel goal as well, because this physical picture of resting one day and the six days working is a spiritual reality that the Sabbath was pointing forward to in Christ. The true rest, and I just need you to listen very carefully to this, the true rest that all of it is pointing forward to is a resting from our works. Just as Jesus rested from his, just as God rests from his. That's what happens when we come to Jesus. Our salvation is not by works, where we have to earn it, we have to keep it, we have to keep it up, we have to manage it. No, our salvation comes by resting ourselves by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We enter into Sabbath rest by resting ourselves from any works that commend us to God and by trusting in Jesus for our salvation. And we find in him, by doing this, true security for our souls. The whole point of the rest, the true place of restoration, the safety in the storm, the sovereign protection from our fiercest enemies, sin, sickness, Satan, even death. We find refuge in God, and we find rest in God. Listen, one of the sweetest verses in the Bible, or sections in the Bible, and you probably know it well, is from Matthew. When Jesus himself says these words, listen, it's Matthew 11, 28. He says, come to me, all who labor, works, right? All who working, all who labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can I just say that there is no better time to experience this rest than right now, right exactly now. It is still called today. And, and that's what we're commanded to in verse 11. We're exhorted, look at verse 11 again now. He says, let us strive to enter that rest so that no one may fail, fall, by the same sort of disobedience. Let us strive to enter that rest that in verse three we saw, if you've already believed, entered into. Now, I know this might sound confusing. It might sound like what you're supposed to do is work, strive, to rest, so that you don't fall by your works, which is disobedience. But what I need you to see, I can't take all the time to explain and unpack all this, is that the disobedience that we see in Israel is a direct result of their unbelief. That's chapter 3. So the striving here that he's talking about is a striving for faith in the sufficiency of Christ's work. He's saying, strive to enter that rest by putting your faith in Christ, not by doing works like legalism or just setting up some sort of uh, routine that you've got to keep. No, we have to strive to believe. Al Mohler says, this means we must work against all of our efforts to prove our righteousness. We must strive against all of our efforts to justify ourselves. I have to strive for that every single day of my life to remember that it's not about me proving myself to God. It's about me resting in God having already proved himself to us on the cross. There's an already not yet characteristic. There's a past tense, we who have believed enter. There's this present tense in verse 11, let us strive to enter. And there is a future element of rest when all of our earthly work will cease and we're swept up into the full security and the full protection of the sovereign king who is making everything right and everything new again. So in summary, here's for like the theologians in the room. Here's the big summary. We see that rest is a state of being, a spiritual reality rooted in God's creation, patterned through Israel's Sabbath keeping, promised to Israel who failed, secured by Christ on the cross, 
offered to us through a relationship with Christ by faith that comes through grace, starting now and lasting into eternity. That's sort of the long version. Uh, the short version is turn to Jesus. Put your hope in Christ and he will give you rest. Now and forevermore. So how do we do that? How do we get into God's rest? Well, lastly, verses 11 through 13, how do we get this faith so that we can experience rest. Because if the difference between hearing it and receiving the benefit, some hear and don't, and some hear and do, if the difference is faith, how do we get faith? And the next thing we see here is that we get faith through the Word of God. The Word of God reveals to us who Christ is. The Word of God is the tool through which we enter that rest. Romans says faith comes through hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so the Word is where Christ is revealed to us. The word of Christ is being read, the word of Christ is being preached, and God through his word is revealing Jesus to our hearts and putting faith into our hearts. And so we see two things. It reveals Christ to our hearts, we see him, and it reveals our hearts to ourselves. The end of this says that as we see his word, his word puts a spotlight on us and, and puts us, exposes us, exposes our sins and our intentions of our hearts, and that's to drive us back to Christ so that we can have rest in him. That's what it means to be set up with faith. So my prayer for you this afternoon is that your heart would be soft towards the words. That as you hear this word, you're going to be you're going to be one who mixes it with faith that you believe, that you trust, and you go through your week as a sojourner in this foreign land, and you'll find rest in Christ through the word. You don't have to wait for rest on Sabbath Sunday. Sabbath is every day in Christ. If you're not a Christian, I would just say again, today is the day. Why would you wait for something so precious as true security and true, true protection and true joy in Jesus? Every gospel preaching church preaches this gospel, preaches this news of, of Christ's rest. And so before I close the sermon, um, it's already been spoken of and alluded to about some of the work that God's doing in Arizona, and I just wanted to sort of draw it, use the ending of this to draw your attention to something that's really exciting that's happening in Arizona for the sake of the gospel. I want you to know about it. I shared it with Robbie. I shared it with Tim. And I want you to pray for it. Uh, because after a period of a couple of years, through conversations about how to see this, this Sabbath rest preached and extended throughout the state so that everyone can experience it, a number of like-minded local churches have begun to collaborate together to see healthy churches planted across the state. It's, it's really out of this vision to want to see this gospel rest extended to every person. Can you, can you just imagine if this gospel was preached to every person in the state of Arizona? That's our heart and our vision. And to do that, we need more churches. We have a lot of people in this growing state. And so the, the Grove Church Planting Network is, as Tim said, it's really a fellowship of like-minded local churches that have a vision to see a healthy church planted within driving distance of every person in the state of Arizona. Laser focus on what God's doing here in Arizona. We have, a, we have an initial goal to see five healthy churches planted collaboratively between our churches by 2030, so in the next eight years. And one of the things that we've discussed as we started talking about this was all of us have a vision to see this take place, but it's really hard to do as a small local church. We don't have, we don't have all the resources of a mega church. We don't have the money. We don't have the people. It's hard to plant off of another church, but we have this hard to see expansion happens. So the question became, what if we were to collaborate? What if we were to partner together and to see this take place? And all of us share the burden. All of us share the training. All of us share the finances and the people. And what if, what if out of 10 churches, three families went from, from each church, and there was all of a sudden a core team of 30 people who could go plant a church in Surprise or plant a church in East Mesa? And so this idea has come together now. Churches that are distinguished by gospel centrality, expositional preaching, preaching God's word, Reformed soteriology, how, how, understanding how we um, get saved, meaningful membership, and a multiplying of disciples. That's the vision of the Grove Network. And right now we've seen seven churches have committed to it, and we talked with another six who are praying about it. We're hoping to be, hoping to be a 501c3 by the end of the summer, 2022, with a conference in the fall of next year to launch for public, the, the network publicly in September. And uh, we're praying for God's blessing, and I hope you will join us in praying for and I've shared it with them. And uh, I'm grateful for the friendship and partnership we already share in the gospel. In Jesus' name. And that's the word of God 
And may God give us all that so I pray. Lord, thank you for this church which embodies these things. And I do pray, Lord, for every person in this room to take honest evaluation of their lives, Lord. Are they experiencing the rest? I pray, God, you put it on their hearts to, to have them experience the rest that you offer them. Where they can really find peace in you. Security, protection, hope. Lord, I thank you for the work you're doing in and through this church and for Grace Church and the other churches of the Grove Network and the other gospel preaching churches across the city and across the state. Lord, I pray we would see ourselves as like-minded brothers and sisters for the same cause that we spread your gospel across the world, Lord, to all the treasure groups. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Uh, Will, there also is a one working document that might answer questions you have, and we'll put that on the church app so you can read about it. Um, and we'll also maybe uh, bring one a hard copy in the weeks ahead so you can think about it, pray about it. And this is we're thinking about how the Lord might want us to connect or participate. We want to at least, at the very least, right, pray for it that the Lord would, would bless uh, that outreach and. The gospel would be spread so that people would enter that rest. What, a, what exciting good news, right, that we have to share. And I think all of us know people around us that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And so as we personalize that day, um, let's ask the Lord to burden our hearts that even maybe what you heard tonight might be the foundation of, of a, uh, sharing the gospel with someone. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we give you praise and thanks as we have sung with songs of gratitude this evening. Uh, your many gifts, um, whether it be life and breath, relationships, most of all, the gift of Christ, the gift of rest that we don't enter by our work, but we enter by faith in the work of Christ, the person of Christ, the success of Christ on our behalf the sacrifice of Christ for our standing. We thank you, Lord, that, that broken, fallen man can be reunited with God. And as we uh, rejoice in that truth tonight, we look around us to the fields that are ripe to harvest. We look around us to the great needs that are in our city, the six largest metro areas in America, where many without hearing any knowledge of the gospel to us that you would give us compassion and burden, not just for the safety of ourselves or the success of our family, but for the needs of those around us, that Jesus would be honored and cherished. Thank you for Chris and Tara coming over tonight. May you bless them and encourage them. We be with you, Grove Network, that the Lord has plans are made, that you would direct and guide them and lead them in your path. 
and the Lord for our living congregation as we seek to be a part of the great commission that you give us wisdom and direct to those ahead.